now that we've had a you know a little first part of it, uh, is this going the way you expected? Is this what? Uh, no is, this, is this interesting? No expectation, but it's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is it interesting? Is this very, is this very okay? Very good. Is it good? Should we just continue? Well, we had we left off. This gentleman was in, trying to say something when we all got up and left while he was talking. So we'll let him start. We'll let him, yeah, we'll let him start up again. Well, uh, this wasn't really that important to me, but uh, just continuing along the, the same discussion that we were having, I was just wondering about uh, um, how we deal with the fact that many people in positions of power, such as BP, well, uh, let's just say that often the foxes are guarding the hen house. You know, so uh, I, I sometimes, I guess it's uh, the defeatist attitude, but I think that we can be the change we want to be in the world. Uh, and still not affect certain yeah. certain outcomes because of the way things are structured yeah. politically or you know economically. That's a good that's a good uh, a good uh, concept like, there. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission folks go to work for Goldman Sachs after they make the rules and they profit from the rules they just made and they leave and sure. go back into government. Revolving doors and you know change uh, happens from the bottom up. It doesn't happen from the top down. There's this concept that, that all the evil's being done to the people in charge. And if you could just get rid of the people in charge, that would fix things. It won't fix anything. Your change has to happen from the bottom up. It really has to happen at an individual level. We have to grow up. As we grow up, things will change. They'll reflect, again, our reality reflects us. As we become different, reality will become different. Because if your reality supports lying, cheating, and stealing, you know, because that's at the level that we're at, then if you eliminate one bunch of lying, cheats, and stealers, you're just going to get another bunch. You know, if you, if you, yeah, you're not, you're not going to do anything real. All you're doing is musical chairs. You're changing things around. That's like uh, one bunch of, uh, you know, rebels, you know, shoots the dictator, and now they're the dictator. You know, even though when they were Rebels, they were out for everybody, and they were part of the people, and then, but once they get in charge, it's different. It's just another dictator. Absolutely. And then, then the rebels come up and get rid of that dictator, and you got another dictator. You know, it just doesn't help. You don't start by saying, well, what's wrong is the dictator. And you know, if we just shoot the dictator, everybody would be happy. Right. It doesn't work that way because our culture, that culture that that dictator comes from, is a culture that supports dictators being there. And that's why, you know, it's like that. So we support the, you know, the Exchange Commission making rules and then profiting. We support BPs. We support all of this stuff because that's the way we are. In general, in our culture, at least in our Western culture, the culture I live in, the basic concept is grab as much as you can get and do as little as you have to for it. You know, that's the, that's the basic thing that, that drives everything. You want to get as much as you can get, and you want to do as little as necessary to get it and to keep it and to hold it. And if that's going to be your basic motivator, then you're going to get all the stuff that you, you know, don't like to see. Because we act like that. They act like that. We don't like it because they have more power than we do. They were more successful at getting things and holding them than we are, right? So they annoy us because of that. But they're not doing anything any different than, you know, the little people are doing the same thing. They're grabbing stuff. They're trying to get as much as they can and get as little for it as possible. That's, uh, that's just standard economics, right? I mean, that's uh, capitalism. You know, that's what you do. You trade and you, you make the best deal possible. It's well, a pattern. It's a pattern we do. We have all this yeah. history. This is a pattern. The dictator gets taken out, then they become the dictator. The, the evil sure. can come into the money. We have this pattern. It happens over and over. We're, we're almost sure. like, oh, it's okay because that's just how it happens. But what if we come to a consensus to change it? Right. Well, the way you come to a consensus is an intellectual. See, an intellectual consensus isn't going to help you any because you're still the same people. You know, if we all get together and hold hands and sing kumbaya and, you know, all talk love and peace and whatever, behind the scenes where you can't see it, it's going to be how much can you get and how can you hold it and what little you have to do to get it. You know, it's going to be the same thing if that's what's inside the people. It's not an intellectual process. So that's why I say the best thing you can do is to fix yourself. 
don't don't go out and try to fix you know BP or, or people whatever. People that have also fixed themselves and then maybe you know, right influence other people. Talk because to people. Because what fixing yourself if it's not going to change anything? It will. It'll change. You fix yourself will influence other people. And the thing is, if it's just an intellect, if it's a matter of you carrying a banner and trying to educate, well, that's fine. You can do that. You can carry the banner and educate, but that's not going to change anybody. They're still the same people. And even if, like I say, even if we all sing songs of peace. They won't make any difference. It's not the action. It's not the words. It's the being at a being level. You change that, and that's as much as you can do. But that does influence other people. It influences the people around you. So we're not going to generate a kinder, gentler, more loving society until we become kinder, and gentler, more loving people. And there's no way you can force anybody else to be kinder and gentler. The only person that you have any control over is yourself. So do what you can do, which means change yourself. So that's really how you fix those things. It's not a matter of going out and lopping off the ugly head. You know, that's not uh, going to do anything. It'll just another ugly head will grow back in the same place or in a, you know, a little different. But it'll be just as ugly as the last one. And all of those revolutions generally tend to turn out to be, you know, false revolutions, or they don't last long. You know, it's just the way we are. We will produce a reality that reflects our quality. We as a group, and we've got it now. And how do you change our quality? Well, like I said, you can't change anybody else's quality. Change your own. Right, but we can change the, the rules that we, you know, organize our societies and, and Yeah, we can do that. We can change them. Sort of like and what is just like the rule set. On right. I mean, what like what you do that we institute and such. What you do when you do that is you create a more civilized society. So let's say we have a society that, that was just, you know, jungle, right? Whoever's the strongest gets right. what they want. And then let's say we have rules and people who, who uh, do things that are against our rules, we put in jail. So now we have a society of laws, right? Well, the society of laws is a more civil society. People are restrained from just the biggest brute, you know, gets what they want, okay? And that's good in a superficial sense. It's good that it enforces better behavior, yeah. but it doesn't enforce higher quality people. Right. The reason that you don't hit somebody over the head and grab their wallet is because you're afraid you get caught. You're no better person than somebody would hit anybody somebody the head and take their money. So the fear of getting caught and put in jail doesn't make you a better person. It makes you act better though. So we like that because it's, civil, it's more civilized. It produces an environment where we can more easily learn because it's hard to, to learn if you're constantly ducking people trying to hit you over the head and steal your wallet, right? So we get a more civil society. It, it gives us breathing room, if you will. We make these rules. And that's good, and that's why we struggle over governments and democracy and freedom and all these words are important words. But the, the form of government you have isn't necessarily going to change the quality of the people. That has to be from the inside out, and that's really where the, where the key thing is. But meanwhile, a more civilized society, a kinder, gentler society, yes, that would be nice. It helps all of us get a little breathing room where we can kind of assess things and look at big pictures because we're no longer in a survival mode where our reality is so narrowly focused on getting by from day to day. Leisure time is a wonderful thing because it gives you time to kind of lean back and think. You don't have any leisure time if you're in survival mode. You're constantly on the defense or the offense or whatever it takes to survive. So yeah, those things are important, but that's not how you get to the end point. That just buys you time. We can have a very civil society that, that underneath is pretty nasty. You know, everything looks good if you don't look too deep. But when you start looking deep, you know, then you see it's rotten underneath. So that's the guy that, you know, he'll, he'll go out and, and be kind and gentle and, and run the charity and do all this. I'm going to go home and kick the dog and beat his wife. You see, he can go outside and look nice and he obeys all the rules, but at home he's still a tyrant. You see, or at work he's a tyrant and abuses his em employees but he obeys all the rules. So yeah, the point is, the way you deal with that reality is through yourself. That's the, that's the fundamental thing. Meanwhile, um, just doing, uh, you know, trying to change it 
to suit you and the way you know is best and best for everybody, that's not productive. It doesn't really change anything. That just, re, you know, like they say, rearranges the, the furniture, you know, on the deck of the Titanic, right? It, this doesn't make any difference. It looks better and it suits you. You like that arrangement better. You say, oh, I like it. Now BP just disappeared from the world, but it doesn't matter. There'll be another BP, you know, because our society supports it. But what if we Change have yourself. society to agree that we don't want to support that? You can't get society to do anything. You can't legislate <laughs> it. You can't force it. You can't threaten them. You know, you yeah, can't no, do anything about it. By giving them information, clear information, so they can make a choice with that they don't want that in their reality yeah. either. Yeah. And then a bunch of them get together and actually do something to change the system, such as make a get together and have a consensus on one party to vote for in 2012. Yeah. That, and then get people in that party running that have integrity. like. You're trying to you're trying to civilize the world, and that's a little bit because we're in that. And that's you fine. Said, what if the world were? You said something like a like a what if if we lived in a world that seemed civilized but was really horrible mm -hmm. underneath, and that we do. Right. You know. We can make it more civilized, and that's and that's worthy to do that. But I'm just saying that's okay, not. That's, that's all I needed. That's not the solution. Right there. No. That's not the final solution, but it, it is helpful along the way. It's, it's, it's not a waste of time. It's a brief, but it's not a waste of time. No, it isn't. And, and part of the things that reason it's not a waste of time, not only does it buy us breathing room if we have a more civil society, but people who learn to act more civil may be one tiny step closer to being more civil. It's a little hard to be full of love and grace when, like I say, when you're, when you're in a survival mode. You know, and when you're in a very rowdy, rough environment that's very, you know, violent, whatever, when you're in that kind of environment, you know, love and peace is a, is a concept but doesn't seem to be a reality. Once it gets to be where you actually have time to sit down and meditate and, you know, connect with your neighbors and your friends and you get support and you get caring and these things are more easily developed in a civil society. But still, it's not that the civil, the civil society just buys you a nicer environment in which to grow. You can grow in a nasty environment, but it's tougher and harder. So it is a worthwhile thing to do, but it's not the solution. It's just it helps enable. Hand hands are not easy. Yeah, it helps enable the solution. Hands up. Um, somebody pick. <laughs> Ron? This one, because I can't see what his hands up. <laughs> uh, for somebody in this situation where they're in a very ego intense atmosphere and they're trying to evolve themselves. Um, I'm speaking from my experience, um, and you feel uh, you're becoming more sensitive, I'm becoming more sensitive to this influence around me. Uh, what would your advice be concerning that situation? Uh, okay, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, often we find in our personal lives that we are around people that uh, Love and, and caring is not exactly the first thing on their mind. Mostly it's me, 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 and they're very self-centered. Uh, we have businesses like that. You know, it's like that at work. It's like that uh, maybe among relatives and other people that we care about, and it gets to be difficult. The problem there can be solved by letting them be how they are, being yourself how you are, and growing. In other words, you don't have to to deal with them and to grow yourself. You don't have to get rid of them or you don't have to leave them or something like that. You know, it's not like if your family doesn't support you, you know, you're gonna have to go and live in a cave. Or that if your your work is full of fascists, you know, who are, you know, rooting for death and destruction, you don't have to, you know, quit your job so you're not in that environment. You have to realize that everybody is basically trying to evolve. That's their thing. I mean, some are actually aware that this is what they're doing. And that's like everybody in the room. You know, we, we, we know we're trying to evolve and we're making some effort. Most people have no idea that's what's going on here. They're just here. But they are fundamentally doing the best they can with what they got. Well, what they got is a lot of fear, a lot of ego and things, but still, they're doing the best they can with what they got. So if you see all these people, instead of thinking, oh, how awful, how shallow, you know, uh, how annoying, you know, this is the problem. These people would just not stop, you know, instead of having that attitude, it's like, well, they're doing the best they can with what they've got. That's just who they are. They don't know any different, you know. They're full of ear, they're, they're full of fear, they're full of ego, and that is the way they are. 
they're working through their choices, making the best choices they can at any time based on what they have. So have compassion rather than aggravation and just let them be. But now you don't have to join them. You know, you don't have to be party to it. And you can be nice to them and you can interact with them and you can work with them and still be yourself. Still be your own self and be on your own growth path and you, you don't have to feel like you need to explain to them the way they ought to be to criticize them and, and point out to them that their ego and that's self-centered and that kind of stuff. If you thought that would be helpful, you could do it, but most of the time it's not helpful. They're not ready for that yet. So you just let them be, have compassion, love them, care, be helpful toward them, and um, it's the way it is. You're not responsible for anybody's growth but your own. So, so. Um, okay. hmm? It's kind of lonely then, no? Yeah, well, you know, it depends. <laughs> it depends. It is kind of lonely in a sense, but in another sense, you get more and more immune to being lonely. Yeah. You know, it's, it's when you're in that, that need for feedback and need for other people to tell you that you're okay and need for those pets and strokes that you get from these relationships, then you, get, you feel lonely. But see, that's mostly your own ego and your own needs. As you let that go, lonely isn't such a big deal. You're just there, you exist, these people exist, and uh, you interact with them. You're nice to them, you help them out, you know, you help them move, you help them, you know, with their work, you do whatever you can do, you have compassion for them, you just don't struggle with them. You live with them and figure that's it, you know, they are the way they are, they'll grow when they're ready. And if you sense that somebody's ready, you know, somebody would like a little help, well, offer a little help, but not telling them the way they should be, that's not helpful. Offer them a, another choice. Well, you know, you don't have to do that way, you don't have to feel that way about it. You know, you choose to be angry. You can choose not to be angry. You know, you could look at it from a bigger picture. And if they take that, fine. Let them have it for a few, six months or so until they internalize it and then help them with the next step. But don't say, well, you're wrong. You shouldn't be like that. Look the way you are. See how unhappy you are. You need to do this. and That's useless. Basically, it's worse than useless. It tends to back them further into, their, into the hole that they're in. It just digs them a little deeper in. So... Be the example, again, you know. If they see that you're fine and that your life is good and that you're happy and things are working for you and, and you know, you're dealing and all that, they'll tend to take whatever you tell them a lot more seriously than if you're trying to tell them what to do, you know, then they don't take you very seriously at all. You're struggling just like they are. And besides that, you think you know everything, you know. So just provide an environment in which they can grow. Offer a little opportunity on the side if they want to take it. And don't push on it. They'll take it when they're ready. And when they're not ready, there's no sense trying to cram it down their throat because you'll just annoy them. You'll back them, you'll back them up. So that's the thing to do. You don't have to leave it. You know, otherwise, what we'd all do is have to go find a cave someplace and live in, right? We'd have to, um, you know, we'd have to rent this room and we'll all live here. <laughs> that's, that's not really the solution to the problem. You're in this world. You have to interact with this world. And if you think you're going to live your, leave your work situation or your family situation and you're going to find a better one, it isn't going to work that way. Because wherever you go and wherever you work, it's going to be the same bunch of people with different faces and names doing the same kind of stuff. You're going to, they're going to be self-centered, have a lot of ego. It's how much can they get for how little can they give. And that's just the way it's going to be because that's our culture. And unless you want to go live in a cave or in a monastery or some other kind of place, you know, that's not what it's about. It's about dealing with these things, learning from it, and uh, growing up. And as you become aware that they're like it, see, once, when you're in them, when you're one of them, you don't notice. You don't think, oh, look, hey, we all have a lot of ego and we're all self-centered. <laughs> you never notice that. It's only when you start to grow. You get unplugged. Yeah, it's only when you, you outgrow that, that you look back and say, oh, you know, those people are all self-centered <laughs> and have ego. And you don't see what self-centeredness and ego you have, right? You don't see that. You only see what they have because you've grown past them. So you can always look back where you've been and it makes sense to you. But where you are and where you're going is a mystery. So that's the way it is. So you're just growing up. You're kind of outgrowing the 
I'm one of the gang with your gang. Well, that's good. Good for you. You know, you're outgrowing it. But don't take that as a, as a downer and makes your life miserable. Learn to live gracefully with that and interact with them. And don't think of them as being inferior or wrong or bad or whatever because they're, they're the way they are. Think of them as just like you, struggling, doing the best they can with what they've got. It's just that you happen to have a little more. You know, what they have is still mostly ego and, and, and self-centeredness. And what you have is a little less of that. So you can suddenly see now where you used to be and where they are. And uh, that's good. But there's somebody else that's looking at you from someplace else, and they see where they've been <laughs> and what they used to be, right? And it's just like that. You just keep, keep growing, keep growing up. But if you let it upset you, it creates a problem. Well, I can feel it non-physically, like, you know, becoming impassive. Yeah, and that you, can, you need to be able to just turn off. That's because you're connected to it. Yeah. What happens is those people start to drag you down. Those people start to affect you. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm with those people. And every time I go into work, I just feel this, you know, my energy draining out of my body. And it, it's yes. like, you know, the zombie, you know, starts to yes. take over my brain. People need you to be a certain way when you're in that situation. Right. You have to but if, take on a role. Because you, cooper, you cooperate with it. If you, if you dislike it, if you have a, you know, as long as your ego is connected to the difference between the way they are and the way you are now, then that will give them like a handle. That's a, that's a connection to you. You're feeding that. Basically, if you just accept it and let it, and let it go, if you're just, it's just the way they are. This is the way I am. I'm not superior or whatever. We're just different. I'm growing on this path. They're the way they are. They're growing, but they're at a different place than I am. And you no longer have that, oh man, those people drive me nuts. You see, that's, a, that's an ego problem. If it's, they're just there, they're the way they are, doing the best they can, <clears throat> poor people, hopefully their lives will get better, you know, that kind of thing. And you're not ego attached to it, then it won't drain you. It won't turn you into a zombie. Yes, you'll have a role you're supposed to fulfill, and you can fulfill that role and do it, you know, but you don't have to do anything that you don't find acceptable. Aren't they you know? expecting a certain reaction from a person for their behavior, and then if you're like him, like Ron, and, and you don't give them that reaction, they've got to eventually notice it. Sure, they notice it, and they think you're a little different. And you just, you just live being a little different. Yeah, it's probably everybody in this room is probably uh, knows that they're a little different, you know, than the, the rest of the people that they hang out with. That's just the way it is, you know. I mean, I mean, yeah, but that's good. That's good. That difference that they notice is something that, that is going to help them because they're also going to notice that you're happier, you know, you smile more and so on, and they're going to notice that difference too. You start to become a good example for them. So that, yeah, you're different. So if you want that feeling of being one of the crowd and fitting into the, you know, fitting into the gang, let it go. You know, you're not going to do that. You're not going to fit into what most of the society that, that you're around. You won't, you're not like them. You won't fit in. It doesn't mean you're superior. It doesn't mean you're better. You're just in a different place. You can still do your job, and yes, People will think, well, it's just a little strange. He's got a lot of goofy ideas. And, you know? But he gets his work done. Yeah, but he gets his work done, and, and you know, he's friendly, and, and there's no problem. So that's all right. They'll accept you. They'll accept you. Yeah, if being, if being strange is a problem, and you're in the wrong place. You, ought to, you, know, you shouldn't, right room, you shouldn't be here. Yeah, you're in the wrong room. You've come to the wrong, you've come to the wrong talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, then, I, want to, I want to talk about the illness coming back. The okay. illness coming back, you heal somebody and they get better, mm -hmm. and then the illness comes back. And the, the underlying reason for the illness is they've got a lesson they need to learn of, that the illness is teaching them. Generally, that's the case. Now, everything is, everything is individual to it. Now, every case is, is different. But just making generalities, that's one of the signs of you really ought to leave it alone because well, it's, you know, it's not... You know, it keeps coming back. Now, you can just keep working on it, working on it. Eventually, if what you're doing is, is forcing them to be in a way that's not most productive for them, mm -hmm. it'll just get to the point where you're just not effective anymore. What if the person's just resigned to the illness and kind of just says, well, I have this? No, well, if their intent really? is working, can, can if their intent is working on having it, and your intent is working on their not, then, again, yeah, it's, well, a, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, force versus force. 
you can force them to be some other way, but why do that? Or, excuse me, also, would you say that all diseases are purposeful or? No, I mean, I, some so are I random. Yeah. I, some are random. We live in a, we, you know, there's a, yeah. there's a lot of randomness going on here. The fact that you just happen to bump into somebody that, you know, has the whooping cough and you get it. Right. Yeah. That's just the way it was. It's not necessarily that there's some big cosmic plan right. that you should meet this person and get the whooping cough. Good. There's randomness going on as well. Yeah. yeah, we don't live in a planned, yeah, everything's not planned. Yeah. Stuff happens. Yeah. And when somebody just happens to get the whooping cough that gets it, then you find those people are real easy to work on and heal. Because, you know, there's no, there's no other force kind of counter force pushing the other way. And uh, you find that those things go like that. On the other hand, you start working at something and you keep working at it and working at it. It's just you can't seem to get any traction. You can't seem to make it move. Well, that's a, your first sign of, well, maybe I shouldn't be doing this. You know, maybe this is not a good thing for me to be doing with my energy. And those ones that, when they, when they work very quickly, usually that's because it was just a random thing that, that happened. But yes, we do have large random components. That's part of what makes this reality so valuable. If it were all patent down in a, you know, a big master game that was going on here, it would be very dull and it wouldn't, I mean, if you try to control everything, you get a very dull result because you can't control all these details. The way you get all this richness of interaction and choices is because there are a lot of random components and we just bump into each other and we all interact and you know, the fact that you do this to me then makes me do something different, which makes you do something different, which makes them think of thoughts they wouldn't have thought, and bing bang, it's just all bumps into each other, and that produces a much richer, more useful set of choices than if it's like, oh yeah, you were meant to, you know, get that disease at this time because you needed that does happen. We we are nudged from time to time for the things that we need. It does happen that Let's say we, are, we have a lot of anxiety in our life, and then you know, as we get older, we end up with a lot of illnesses too. Well, there's a connection there. See, we're creating that reality. It's not just random. So there's a lot of parts of it that are not random that we create, but it's not all random. I mean, it's not all random. It's not all planned. It's, it's a mixture of both. What I was trying to get at was, would it be a more productive use of my time rather than trying to heal the illness to heal the underlying root cause? Sure. Help them learn the lesson that the illness is trying to teach them. Absolutely. If you have some insight as a root cause, or even if you don't, working on that may be a much more effective thing than trying to take away a symptom. You know, that's true of anything. You know, you can, you can take a painkiller to kill the pain, but if it doesn't affect the cause of the pain, you either have to take the painkiller forever, you know, or you have to figure out what the cause is. Mm -hmm. So, surely. Okay. That uh, often those kinds of things are symptoms. You know, I mean, any statistical study will tell you that anxiety is going to lead to more health problems than if you don't have a lot of high anxiety, you know, or stress. stress. All these things, you know, that uh, yeah, get to the source. One other question, Tom. Uh, we were talking about some things being ready to jump out from the bushes, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if we could talk a little about how that relates to 2012 because I know there's a lot of fear mongering out there with respect to what we're in for, and it's close, you know, it's next year. It's next year, yeah. Well, you create your own reality, right? So if, if you create your own reality and there's millions of people who are filled up to here with fear, mm -hmm. then the probability of something fearful happens just went up, right? You create your own reality. So yes, that does, you know, that does raise the, raise the probabilities that something terrible will happen. Mm -hmm. So, self-fulfilling prophecies, right? Strap on your helmet. What? What? Say, strap on your helmet. It's <laughs> so, so yes, but, you know, I think the proper attitude to have for 2012 is that you'll see what happens when it gets there, and you'll deal with it when it happens. You know, if you get if 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 a voice comes into your head that says move to the high ground, you know, <laughs> then move you probably ground. ought to move to the high ground. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Pay attention. But if no voice tells you to do anything, and you probably are where you need to be, and and uh, you know, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. So uh, Thank you. just take it as it as it comes. But don't join those who are fearful, that are helping create a, a fearful result. 
Just one more thing while I got your attention. <laughs> <laughs> You're worse than me. Yeah. You, were, you were talking about Lyle, and you couldn't remember his last name. Yeah. I think it's Fuller. Fuller. Lyle Fuller. You're right. Josh has, has had a question for Josh. Um, I, I want to go back to uh, acting some way where, where you're talking about acting civilized mm -hmm. uh, versus like being civilized. So when when does if somebody wants to you know grow and they want to become better uh, like a better person, when does when does that change happen from acting towards being? You know, like let's say for to give a, a, a simple example is you're like all right you know. I'm too mean when I drive or something, so I'm going to be nicer when I drive. At some point, I mean, you're you're still acting because you're you're remembering that you you made this decision. Mm -hmm. But at some point, either it becomes habit or, but does that have anything to do with the affecting your being? Yeah, if there's a if your intent is that you just want to act better, it may not ever affect your being. You may just act better. Okay. If your intent is that you want to be better. You don't want to get angry and have to suppress it. You just want to not get angry at these things. And if that's your intent, and then you work at that intent, which means you use your intellect to force yourself to, you know, to act better, you will eventually get to a point where you you jump to anger more slowly, more slowly, and then eventually it's gone, and there'll be a transition. And that would be the point where I'd say, you get it. You don't really get it until it gets into the being level. You say, well, okay, intellectually I know getting angry at drivers, getting angry at traffic is foolish. I mean, traffic just is, you know, and people who are 80 years old are allowed to drive cars, and people who are 16 years old are allowed to drive cars, and traffic is the way it is. So you might as well just say, you know, you know, that's, I'll deal with it. I won't be aggravated because that little old lady's going 30 mile an hour in a 50 mile an hour zone. I'll just put right along behind her and that'll be fine and I won't try to cram her and I won't try to, you know, get through this little spot and you just relax and, and, and do it. Then eventually, if your intent is to be that way, I think you probably will. And acting that way may be a help, may be part of the process. So. So the, the civilization can, you know, as you civilize your behavior, that can be on your process as long as your intent's there to convert that into actual change of your being. And then it's not a matter that you have learned to suppress your rage. It's a matter that you don't have any rage. Is that the difference between a habit and actually being differently as the intent? Yes. If it's a habit, you're still, well, I don't know. It's kind of hard. It's, it's, these are words. It's hard to tell what we say the words mean, you know, but... Uh, Yes, in general, I'd say that that's, that's probably the way we use the words. A habit would be something you do just because you do it, and that's the way you've always done it. That may or may not be at the being level. It could be at the being level. You just the difference is: do you do something? You know, if let's say you see a, a little lady and she's at an intersection and it's a busy intersection, and you know that she's really frightened about going across, and so if you you stop and help her, just because that seems like the right thing to do. I mean, look, there's somebody there. I'll take my time and I'll help her then that's at the being level. If you say, well, look at that little old lady, you know, I should help her, that would be a nice thing to do. Well, I probably have time, you know, I can, I can probably help her, I'm not due there for another 20 minutes yet, so then you go help her. That's coming out of the intellect. You're acting the way you think you should act. They're, one's different than the other. I think that's trying it on. I think yeah. that would be trying it on. You try on that behavior and then you see how it makes you feel. Yeah, so it's, it's part of the process. But the intent has to be there. If your intent is just to, to look good, then you may never turn that, convert that into being. If your intent is converted into being, you probably will. Because if you work on it, if you have that intent long enough, and you keep that intent up in the front of your mind, you'll get there. You will move towards your intent. That's the way the system works. But isn't it all just about awareness then? So if your intent is to be more aware of your habits, your emotions, your behaviors, and when you're interacting in society, if that's your intent, then is there something that accumulates, like that you can see that, uh, that accumulates within the being level where you get to a certain point that your awareness grows because your intent is to be more aware of yourself and your actions and so forth, and then at some point you just kind of see, oh, I'm getting angry, and you kind of see it, and then you're able to just diffuse it, because then yeah. it becomes something where it's like you can see these things, it's, and, and and at, at that point, your awareness is at a level where 
I guess you can see from a different perspective where it's, this is not important. Yeah, cutting that's, the old lady off is why you're going to do You know what I'm saying? That, yeah, that's, that's probably stage two, but you will get to the point where you, where you don't even notice. You just don't get angry. It's not that you get angry, notice, and then let it go. That's part of the process of getting there. But eventually, when you get that into your being level, these things just don't bother you. That's, you just don't Simply, uh, even get there. Yeah. Because one thing is about you, and the other thing is about her. So that's yes, the difference. If that's it's always about you because you're angry, it's always ego. It's about you. Yes. And, and the time thing, that's because it's about you. Right. If it's about her, oh my gosh, I hope she's okay. What can I do? I'll try and help her. Then it's right. about her. Oh, or somebody's exactly. coming across you and you go, wow, I hope that's really dangerous. I hope they don't hurt themselves or have an accident. Then it's yeah, about let them. Let me back off a little bit and yeah. give them more room. Yeah. Then you're not, they just, you don't, there is no anger. Right. It doesn't ever exist. So yeah. once you get at the being level, then it's, again, your, your motivation, your intent, it's about other people. You know, it's about you caring and you never get to that point. So if what you're trying to do is just raise your awareness, that's probably good, but that's probably a step in the process. Eventually, that anger won't even be in your awareness. You can't even know you're angry. Like some people don't even know what they're doing. They're not even aware of their own behaviors. They're angry, they're jealous, they're egoic, they're, yeah. they're not even aware of right. themselves. Awareness is no doubt a first step. Did Absolutely. You someone off yourself every so often <laughs> to, <laughs> to realize how anyone can do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the same thing that, that Ron was saying. You know, he's, he's aware that these people are different. He's aware that these people have a lot of ego. He's aware that this workplace is not a bunch of loving people who are out trying to, you know, help each other and be nice. And, you know, he's aware of this. And that awareness is a little hard to take and he's struggling with it. But eventually he'll get past that awareness. It really doesn't matter. They're just people. And, and, then, and then it won't affect him. He won't have this, oh, I hate going into work every day because this is so icky. He just won't have any of that. He'll just go to work and they're just people and it's fine. And he'll get along with them. And uh, he's taken that lesson to where it doesn't matter anymore that they are the way they are. He's accepted that they are the way they are and it's, that's okay. And then sometimes they look better. All of a sudden, all these things, these behaviors that drove you crazy, don't drive you crazy anymore, and you start seeing them as people who have their own problems and their own, you know, right. and, you, and you actually like them better. Right, the anger turns into compassion. Right. Instead of you, instead of, it bothers me, it's about you, it's, oh, look at that, they're, they're, they're shooting themselves in the <coughs> foot, they're doing these things that, you know, creating, I feel sorry for them, you know, I feel empathy for them, that they're like that, but they are, and... They choose to be that way, and then, you know, you just let it be. Yeah, you're perfectly right. It has to do with whether it's about you, ego, or whether it's about somebody else. So, do, you, oh, oh, go ahead. do you think that when intent acts, there is still some decision that uh, the being level at the root, uh, this is a digital system, there is some kind of decision still? Yeah. Uh, maybe we couldn't call it intellectual, but, but it's some, yeah. some kind of decision. There. Some sort of decision that's made, but those decisions are, you know, they're based on the way you are at the, at, the, at the root, at the core, and you do act those ways, but it's not an intellectual decision. Yeah. Because the way, the way I, I compare the intent uh, with other things I see, for example, for the brain, is that when we do something often, like in a training, mm -hmm. uh, the brain builds more connections to that, mm -hmm. so so the, it becomes like a closer connection. The decision is more like uh, certain, like uh, sure. faster. Mm -hmm. So there is an analogy in the way you think it works in the. Yeah, well, let's talk about brains for a little bit. That's that's a good subject. Uh, we've kind of been, been wandering around in the same subject for a while. So let me change it a little bit, and we'll go to um, kind of the connection between the larger reality system and our physical system, and brains, and, and uh, you know, what, we, what, what are we? How does, this, how does this reality game work, right? I mean, how is it that we are consciousness, but yet we have bodies, and what's the interface, and how is that connected? That's, that should be an interesting topic. Um, the, uh, the brain, or the, let, me start, let me back up and start at the beginning. We start with the premise, or with the idea, that consciousness leads and the body follows. Okay? Consciousness leads and the body follows. Now, the way this world, the way this reality 
this, this game we're in got started is that it evolved. Okay, you start with a rule set and then you let it evolve. And when you let the rule set evolve, now we're talking about in a computer, right? If you think about a computer, and again, all these, these are metaphors. You know, in a computer is a metaphor. So you start in a computer and you set up this rule set and you say, all right, according to these rules, and you start with a big bunch of energy all in a spot and then you let the big digital bang happen, which means you hit the run button and it starts to interact and evolve and expand and coalesce and you get universe and planets and solar systems and suns and planets and then the little amino acids get together and make a cell and blah, 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 blah. You know, and here we are. So we've got our, our, our universe now, which has evolved in this big digital computer someplace. Okay. Now, it's evolved according to this rule set. So now here we're going to inhabit this world. So that's where the that's where the set comes from. It wasn't a bunch of programmers that, that sat down and, and you know had to had to program every blade of grass and every tree, but it just evolved. But that's our set. That's our digital set. So then so we have that then as as a rule set which determines what kind of things can happen here. You know, things fall down, you know, things evolve, critters evolve, you know, fish to reptiles to to mammals and so on. So that's, that's the set that we're playing in. When we get in this vir virtual reality game, the set evolved. Now, how do we get into this game? You know, how do we do it? What is it that the conscious does and then suddenly, you know, boom, you know, he ends up a body, you know, walking around in this reality game. How does that happen? Okay, well, there is really no physical reality. It's just data. it's a set of rules that evolved and here's the way they evolved and it, it, here's the way energy transfers go on. Here's the way things happen here. So what happens is that you have you're a consciousness, and if you're going to get into this rule into this game, it's not that you create a body and come in here. It's that that you have a a subset of your own consciousness. So you're a, you're a, what do I call it? An IUOC, an individuated unit of consciousness, right? So you take part of your consciousness, part of your awareness, and you say, all right, I'm going to abide by the rules of this rule set. In other words, I'm going to get into the game. Okay, so you take that little part, and I call that a free will awareness unit. So that's a little part of your big consciousness, and you say, this little piece of consciousness, I'm going to involve in the, in the game. So now basically all you're doing is saying, I'm going to do and interact in such ways that are in consonance with the rule set that evolved this game. Okay, now how are you going to do that? So now you have this body, but it has to be a body that fit, fits the rule set, right? So you can't have a body, let's say you can't be a person with a body who can jump you know, 20 feet in the air because the rule set didn't evolve a form like ours to jump 20 feet in the air. Just don't do that because we don't have those kind of muscles, we don't have those kind of joints, we're just not made that way. So you're restricted as to what you can do, how fast you can run, you know, uh, how quickly you can solve problems in your head, you know, all of that is, is fixed by the rule set of what evolved here. Okay, so our physical bodies, including our brains, then represent the constraints of this reality frame. Physical matter reality constraints, which are basically defined in the rule set and the evolution that created the possibilities, created the probabilities that define this rule set. Now, when, our, when the big digital bang happened and all this stuff evolved, it didn't necessarily do that in a deterministic way. It did that in a probabilistic way. So we have this big set of probabilities, the way things could be, are most likely to be, as opposed to aren't very likely to be. So we have this big probability system, and we can join that probability system, but we are restricted to what that system evolved, what did probably evolve. So, okay, let's say we're human form. So we can't jump 20 feet, we can't run you know, 20 miles an hour, we can't do certain things, and as we, as we evolve here to do things, then we can get changes, okay? So first we were just fish, and then reptiles, and then whatever, and that evolves, so things are still changing. It's still an evolving set of probabilities. So now what about our brain? The consciousness leads, the body follows. So let's say we have this little piece of our brain, and this piece of brain is, is uh, responsible for compassion or empathy or something. And biologists can do that. They can you know, say that, oh, here's somebody, and you show them a picture of a little baby or something, and suddenly this part of their brain lights up, and that's their empathy or compassion or whatever. And they, they map the brain as according to 
what circuits, you know, what parts of the brain get activated with certain kind of emotions or feeling or fear or whatever. So they do that. So we develop the ability as consciousness to be compassionate. Well, if we develop that ability as consciousness to be compassionate, what we have in our bodies has to be in consonance with the rule set. So we develop our brains to represent a portion of our, you know, brain then will start to grow a portion of our brain that then has to do with compassion. So it's not that the brain evolves to a point where it can do a compassion and then we become compassionate. It's that we become compassionate and the brain has to then modify itself, if it can, within the bounds of the rule set, to express that compassion. You see? So it goes that way. So now as we, as we learn and grow, as we become love, as we get rid of our ego, we're actually getting different things in our brain, different structures, different physiology, different growth that represents our evolvement. We're not the same physical being because our physical being has to express us as consciousness, but it can only do that within the rule set. Okay, so now somebody comes up to you and, and uh, you know, they, they take a chunk of your brain out, and that chunk of the brain is the one that maybe had uh, compassion. Maybe that's where those circuitry were, was that expressed compassion. Well, now you can't feel compassion anymore. You're compassionless. Everything's flat, right? Because the rule set, you know, you can no longer express that within the constraints of the rule set. Okay, so it does affect us. So that's why, you know, brain injuries can maybe change your personality. But then you can probably change that back again with, with effort. You can, you're, you have a, a stroke and now you can't move your right arm. Well, if you keep working on it and working on it with an intent, your brain will modify itself to meet that need and will kind of rewire, if you will, and regrow what's required to move that arm. Even though the part of the brain that used to do that's not there anymore. So it's, that's the kind of interaction we have. So here we are, this portion of, a, of, a integrated, of an individuated unit of consciousness, and we're a free will awareness unit that has decided to restrict ourselves to data consistent with the rule set. Okay, so now we're getting the data that only doesn't allow us to do certain things, allows us to interact. Uh, you know, so we're sharing data in this multiple, multiple player reality frame. And as we change, our body changes. But we can't say, oh, you know, I'm going to really think real hard about jumping 20 feet in the air because I'd really love to do that. I mean, what a basketball player I would be. You know, I could jump you know, so high that, you know, it'd be easy. You can do it in the moon. <laughs> yeah, you can do it in the moon because the rule set allows it on the moon. The rule set doesn't allow it here with our, with our bodies. So you, you're not going to be able to do that. You're just not going to be able to jump 20 feet in the air with this body, you see, because the rule set says you can't. Now, does that mean that you can't break that rule set sometimes? No, you can break that. But now you're back to the science certainty principle, and eh, not if all the TV stations are there and everybody's watching you and the lights are on. You know, you're not going to do that because it's just not likely that the system's going to allow that because you're going to we're going to end up like West Africa if it does. You know, so the system isn't going to isn't going to support that kind of behavior. So that won't happen. But you so in a in a sense. There's no constraints, but in a sense, there are constraints, and it's a pretty complex system that we live in. So that's the, that's the connection with, the, with kind of the brain. And what the brain is then, the brain is a, is a representation of the constraints that you have in this physical reality. So the, the degree to which you can feel empathy is the degree to which you have developed. Empathy and your brain reflects that. Would Arthur's brain be a good reflection or a good example of that? Hmm? His brain is has autism, but right. when he's asleep, when he's not, when he's, but our, his individual unit of consciousness doesn't. No, his indiv his individuated unit of consciousness does not have autism or does not have damage or anything. Yeah. It's just, in the, you know, his brain now has. He agreed to this. Certain connections or disconnections or whatever yeah. that limits his behavior limits the way he interacts. And it may open up other ways to interact that we cannot even imagine because we've not had that experience. It's just different, Yes. you see? It's, it's, uh, so it's, it's a limitation though here, just like if you were, you know, you could but be- But that's a good example of like that, that uh, it's, it's not that a, 
of a brain, like his brain, if they looked, would be would uh, have a. If a, if they knew exactly of, what it was, they'd the have larger, signs the of that. Fun, I know the I know yeah, the names. Yeah, exactly. Those kind of stuff. So that's the that's kind of what our body, and when I say brains, that, that shouldn't really, we separate brain from the body, like the brain's the thing that, you know, is where our consciousness is, and the, and the body's different, it's not like that, it's all, it all is just data, but the data that we're getting is restricted to physical matter reality rule set, but we can change it in the sense, that we can, like, just like we can change our health, we can, how can you use your mind to affect somebody else's health? Well, what you're doing is that you're changing the probability of the way they are, and their body can then modify itself, can change to fill out that probability. You can do the same with yourself. So if you do, like, like developing it. empathy, you develop empathy, then your brain modifies to represent that ability. If you learn, if you, you start running, you run and you run and you run, you run marathons, what happens is your body changes to represent that capability. Suddenly the, the the efficiency with which you exchange oxygen in your, in your lungs changes. It's not like it used to be. It, your body changes because, you, you know, because of what you do. And it's the same with the consciousness. So I, I, sometimes I've brought up in the past uh, some research that was done with, with uh, sheep. Somebody noticed that sheep were moral animals because if you have sheep and one mother sheep gets killed, we won't say why, if somebody wanted to eat her, but she gets killed, and they have, they have lambs that they were nursing, say, the other sheep will come in and nurse those lambs and take care of them, basically, you know, raise them, take care of them. So they just don't starve to death because their mother was killed. Other female sheep that are, you know, able to will nurse and, and take care of those lambs. And they said, well, that's moral behavior because the, the, the female lambs that are nourishing somebody else's offspring are not furthering their own, you know, their own genetics. Because we, we baby lambs saying, give me some milk, baby? It's that the other lamb is willing to go and do let that. The, let the strange the, the, lamb in. Yeah, and the, 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 the point the is... The lamb doesn't go out and look for those babies, those orphan babies, to feed. The babies say, hey, I'm hungry. There's something that looked like my mom. There's a teat. Let's right, go check it. and the mother lamb accepts them. And that's, that's the good, that's the yeah. empathy. Yeah, the mother lamb accepts them. Because yeah. that doesn't happen in a lot of species. Horses, no. the baby starves to death because the right. mother bear will not take another pole. No. Right. So that's very, it's a very unusual. That's yeah. why it's an exception. Yeah, that's, it's an exception. So, so the, the, the difference of the mother lamb seeking out the baby, noticing that the no Well, I don't know. They, and now, that's a detail, Betty, that I don't know. Maybe the mother lamb does notice that there's a lost lamb and go over and get it. I don't, well, I don't know. Elephants actually will, an ant or whatever, will actually take, you know, it isn't a baby funneling around just trying to find something. The extended family will actually take the baby, the orphan baby, and bring it in and raise that's it. What, right. That's what I'm after. But that's a little yeah. higher than sheep. But, right. Yeah. So anyway, we have, they had this thing with the sheep and they noticed what they called moral behavior. And the reason they called it moral behavior is Straight evolution biology says the only reason we ever do anything is because it furthers the, you know, our survival and our procreation. That's it. So then they look at this and say, well, for an, another sheep to feed one that's not, doesn't have anything to do with their genetics, that doesn't further anything. Right. They're doing this. It's, it's altruism. You see, they're right. doing it even though it takes away from their own. Right. That milk could have been gone to their own lambs. Well, it isn't. She's sharing it with another, but theirs will get by. So we're seeing altruism. They said that's moral behavior on the part of the sheep. So what do you do when you find moral behavior on the part of a sheep and you're a scientist? You kill the sheep. You look at their, you look at their brain. And sure enough, they're on the brain, that part that has to do with moral behavior, there was this extra lump there, you know, like the, the horse didn't have, you know. And they, the conclusion was that their brain evolved to allow them to have moral behavior. You see, because and it's, it's just the yeah, and, and it's just the other it's just the other way around. They develop moral behavior out of the choices that they made, and then the brain changed to support that behavior. You see, so science gets it just 180 degrees, you know, backwards. They see the causality is that the physical thing caused the behavior, mm -hmm. but it isn't. It's the behavioral thing caused the physical reality. So that's the that's kind of what your, what your brain is. And people will, will, will have this, this uh, 
idea that uh, the brain is the is like the, a receiver, you know, and it's talking to the non-physical, and the brain is the organ that's the, you know, transmitter and receiver, and it's really not like that. That's because they're again, their habit is to think of us as physical beings. But that's and, why I don't get AI because AI. If you're developing a robot, no matter how sophisticated it is, how can it develop consciousness? That the consciousness doesn't come from the outside. Because no. there's no mind. To consciousness the doesn't come from the outside. Consciousness has to develop. So what happens is you need to produce, if you're doing AI, if you produce a platform, you know, an, an ability to, uh, that, that, feeds, that meets all the needs of consciousness, you know, it's self-modifying, it has to have a purpose, and it has to have memory, it has to have feedback. You see, you have all those things. And if it's of enough complexity, with enough choices, consciousness will just happen. You don't have, you don't, AI wants to design in consciousness. Consciousness isn't designed in, it isn't made, it happens. You give a, a, a platform that can be conscious, and it will be conscious. So if you have a computer or a piece of hardware or a human brain or whatever and it's there and it can be conscious because it has all the requirements, consciousness will just happen and it will start to evolve. And when it first evolves, I mean when it starts to evolve, it may be consciousness like on the level of a bumblebee. You know, it may be consciousness at a very low level of, of you know, it doesn't mean that poof, you got a human consciousness. Right, it right. just means that you have something that interacts and makes choices and is self-modifying on a very rudimentary level. If that has enough room to evolve in, you know, if there's enough, we're talking about the brain, you know, if it can modify itself, like if it can grow its brain, the part that has empathy, then it will. It will develop these things and it will evolve based on the choices it makes. So the AI guys want to design it in. Of course, if you design it in with algorithms, then it's limited to logical sequences. And we all know that doesn't have anything to do with consciousness, right? Yeah, We're not very logical. Right? They're trying to design in human consciousness. They're trying to design in any kind of consciousness, they'd be happy. But Did they... they have to have, does, I mean, this is a thing I've always wondered about AI, is, is to have human, uh, to, to have uh, the Turing test. Right? Yeah, they'd have, like, they would they like... They have to program in fear. No, they don't program fear. They don't program in consciousness. That's the I thing. I mean, I wouldn't develop fear on its own, I don't. It might mm -hmm. develop fear on its own, sure. It might, if it had something to be fearful of, that might develop. It depends on the, the choices that it has. Now, you're not going to get a computer to be conscious like a human's conscious. A computer has different sets of choices. They don't have the same sets of choices we do. Now, is a computer going to develop a fear that somebody's going to pull a plug? You know? That's what I'm that, that nobody will change the batteries? You know, well, that's, that's, yeah, that's a possibility, you know. But they're just different environment than us, so it's going to be a different consciousness. But consciousness just happens. Now, does that consciousness, so let's say we have a computer, and that computer has what it takes to be self-modifying and to be conscious. So consciousness develops, and let's say this computer has lots and lots of choices that it can make and lots of different ways that it can change itself. Mostly computers don't, right? They have only very limited decision space, things that they can actually change themselves is almost minuscule. Well, let's say that this computer has lots of different choices and therefore it has lots of ways to evolve. And it, does it have a non-physical part? Does it have a soul? Well, sure, consciousness is non-physical. See, again, you're thinking physical. Well, you have this physical thing and we're bodies and the body has a soul. And it's not like that. We're just talking about data, rules, information, and that is non-physical. Information is non-physical. So yes, it has a non-physical part. And if we want to, in our own model, in our own metaphors, metaphors call that a soul, well then, yes, the computer has a soul. But that's kind of silly, because we're saying we're physical, and then we have this non-physical part. Well, we're really not. We're non-physical. The computer is also just data and non-physical. It's part of this game. It, it also has its non-physical part. And if you trashed the computer and threw it away and unplugged it and ran it through a, a shredder, would that non-physical part still exist? Well, of course that non-physical part still exists. And could that non-physical part then inhabit another computer someplace? Like, and sure. You see, it's all data and conscious. Once you have a group of rules and data and things that's evolving and growing, it's there. It's in the non-physical. It's not like if the body goes away, it disappears. You know, again, you're thinking the body, the physical is being fundamental, and the non-physical is derivative. It's not like that. In a larger conscious system, 
the non-physical is fundamental, and this is derivative. So it's, is that? Yeah, the, the one question is the, the way you're explaining it is when you originally started it, you said like, you know, there's a consciousness that wants to be in our reality, so they had to conform to the rule set, you know, and this mm -hmm. is the expression of that. Um, but when you were talking about the computer, you almost talked about it in reverse, whereas people set up the computer or the AI or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you said consciousness happens. But is it more of something has to uh, intend to kind of animate that in the same way that yeah. the well, non-physical part animates the body, or is it, is it just? It's both. Okay. It's, it's both. It's, it's, remember, I also said that if you then shred that computer, you have that non-physical part that then could get back into the game. So you see, it, it works both ways. If you have, in this rule set, you have a, a system that can develop consciousness, okay, then it does develop consciousness. And now that consciousness can cycle back in, into some other host, some other, you know, some other uh, can, can have another, you see, again, we think of physical bodies. It's like it has to come and get in your physical body. That's not right. It doesn't come and get in your physical body. This is all played out in in digital information space. It's not played out here in the physical. So yes, once you have an entity that has, that has, you know. Proto-human? I mean. Yeah, you know, it's an IUOC. You know, it's an individuated unit of consciousness. And can it then get back in the, in the, in the game? Yeah, why not? It's the same with people. So what happens is this, this, uh, this reality we have, it's a digital, probable, informational reality. And we can inhabit it in this multiplayer game in the way that we do. And by inhabiting it doesn't mean that we come down and, and you know locate a, locate a body and jump in it, you know, and jump into the brain. That's our bias about thinking everything's being physical. It's all being played out in information space. So yes, it works both ways. You have the platform and consciousness develops, and consciousness can, you know. Conscious already developed can find a platform to host it. So it, it happens either way. You have available platforms and So rather than inhabit, it's experience. We're not inhabiting something, we're experiencing this. Yes, we're you're experiencing this, body. this is an experience. So you have a piece of your of your larger consciousness, your your individual unit of consciousness, and a piece of that is only going to get data that abides by this rule set. Okay, and the data it gets that abides with this rule set turns out to be this, you know, this is this reality, and, and it's a, again, it's a multiplayer game, so, you know, you're there and you can hear what I say, and I may say things that influence you, so it's a, it, it, characters influence each other, like they do in multiplayer games, which means you have basically two rules that you always have to abide by. And one rule is that you can't violate the rule set, at least not up front and in the light, very often, and you have to have what I call historical consistency. You know, it can't be like, um, you know, if we walk out that door, we're going to be, you know, in Alaska. You know, even though we came in here out of North Carolina. You know, it's not going to happen. You need historical consistency. Your reality has to be kind of continuous in a, in a logical sense. So those are the two rules. You can't break the rule set and you have to have this historical consistency. So we can't keep changing our story as we, as we go. And as long as you abide by those two things, that leaves a lot of room for other things to happen <coughs> and for other possibilities to grow. And it's in those things that we can, we can influence and we can change I have a question, Tom. Uh, let's think about the evolution of uh, PMR, or maybe it happens already in another planet. The, this artificial intelligence is super evolved I and mean, very capable. Mm -hmm. So inside PMR, they can improve it by having better circuits. Uh, they can change, mm -hmm. and then they might change the quality of, of that thing. Let's say, right? By adding components or, or yeah. So mm -hmm. why is it that in PMR they might be able to change the quality by fixing it by making it better? And it doesn't seem to happen that in NPMR. Yeah, it does happen in NPR in the same way. The way, the way they make it better here in PMR is that they, they add potential. They add something that gives it new choices it didn't have before. In other words, they, they add something that increases its decision space. So before it couldn't get into that decision space, now it can. 
you know, because the processor's faster or something else allows them to do things that they couldn't do anymore. Well, we're the same way in the sense that, like I said, if we develop empathy, we develop a part of our brain now that can process empathy. We didn't have that before, but now we do. So we've, it's not that you add the part that gives it the capability, but that you develop the capability, you know, in a biological system, you develop the capability that then reflects the part that it, that it needs. In a mechanical system or in a system, in a physical system, like that, you have to add the part that gives it that possibility. You change the body because you're creating the body of the computer. You know, the, the constraints of the computer you're creating is you can add a part. Here, our bodies, we're just part of the evolved, you know, what evolved, what probably evolved in the rule set. So then we work with, with changing that. If you're in the non-physical, it's the same way. You grow, you learn things, and you have aha moments, and you change you at the being level. And when you do that, what's you is changed. It grows to change that. So when you have a, when you have a, a system like that, it can always grow, and the, whatever you want to know, the collection of code, the ones and zeros, the rules, the whatever it is that makes up you in that, in that uh, non-physical set, it grows too. It changes to. What do you think can happen that in NPMR they can change some part of the data to make it more efficient? Yeah. By a, by a real change? I mean. Well, it's, it's, you see, if you're, it depends on, you know, you can think of these realities as being nested, right? If we're in a physical reality and then we make a physical computer, we can add a part to it, or we can change out its memory, all right? Now, the computer can't do that to itself, right? And the computer would have a hard time growing up in a way that it changed its, its, its circuitry, or change, you know, it can't add another chip into itself. Okay, because, but we are the kind of, if you will, the creating, the creating reality by making the computer, so we can add things to it, all right? It has to only grow up into the, into the potential it has, and it's limited. So if we limit it to a certain amount of memory and speed, well, that's it. It just can't do any more than that. It's limited within that, just like if you know, somebody cuts part of your brain away, you're limited. You just can't do any more than that, all right? But if you are, if you're non-physical, Okay, you're a non-physical being, then you can't just go out and add a, add a chunk of data to it because you're like the computer who can't add a component in. You're working on that level. But now on the level, you take another higher level above that, you know, which we call the larger consciousness system or ROM or something like that. Can they add a component that would, well, why not? So you see? Why, yeah, why not? That's, that's possible. But it's not something that, that we do because you have to go to the next level up. You know, you kind of like the creator can, can change the creation, but the creation doesn't change itself. So it's that sort of, of thing. That, yeah, there is a possibility there, but basically we have already everything we need to grow into whatever it is we can become. You know, we don't need a new component. We're not like a, a physical computer is limited by the physical parts we put in it. We're not a physical thing. As a non-physical, we're just part of consciousness, and we're not limited. Our limitations are the limitations of consciousness. So we can grow to whatever consciousness can, can support, which, since the whole system's consciousness, see, we're there. We have, all the, we have all the potential that consciousness has. Now, let's say we're a subset of something else. Let's say there was this big computer, and it was massive, and, and, and you know, we may be the game inside of it, right? Uh, maybe a mainframe someplace. You know, in somebody else's reality, you see, but now we're getting silly. This is all conjecture. But there's nothing wrong with, you know, conjecture. It's just a possibility. So you could think about some other reality frame that built this big physical computer, physical in their frame, and then we're playing inside, you know, and they named that big mainframe OM, you know, and we're a game that evolved inside of that. And then our virtual realities are games that evolved inside of this. And you end up with a big fractal process that keeps repeating itself. And where does it end? Well, you know, that's like the, the intestinal bacterium. That's, that's, outside of our, that's outside of our grasp. You just can't go there. So you can say, sure, you know, we don't know where the, where the end goes. And there's no reason why it has to be an infinite sequence. It could just be, well, that's the one it started with. You know, because it just happened, which is kind of the way I start in the book. I say, well, it was just this potential, and it evolved to be this way. You know, and I say that because, you know, that's about all you can say. 
Yeah, there's not much you <laughs> could say past that. So okay. that's you know that's where it ended up. But there's any amount of conjecture that could put another level of reality outside of our level of reality. They could see us as parts that could, you know, whatever. But conjecture is usually not very profitable, other than you could say, well, possible. We don't know, no way to tell. It's outside of our digestive system, and we really just don't know. Mm -hmm. you know so again, you just accept certainty gracefully. And say, well, that's kind of out of our, you know, beyond our pay grade, as they say, right? We don't, we can't get there. <laughs> from, from your experience, do you think that fear is something that it always tends to happen? In other words, let's suppose uh, in the NPMR they're able to fix fear, make it disappear at a certain moment. But uh, because of the, the complexity of the system, it might come back again, and that's why they have to keep. Uh, well, there is fear among non-physical beings. If you go to other, I mean, we're all non-physical beings, but if you get, you know, with this NPR and, and, and NNPR and all of this is just kind of relative, right? This is only physical. This is only physical because that's the way we, we interpret it to be. Um, if you get out of this physical reality, you get into another reality. Well, the beings there don't see themselves, oh, we're non-physical beings. You know, they're, they're just sort of like we are, you know. It's just they're not physical to us. So many of them have fear. You know, there's fear everywhere. There's fear in most of these reality frames, you know, have, have fear in them. Fear is a, basically a lack of love, if you want to put it that way. You know, love is where we're going. And if you're not there yet, then the part that hasn't, that's not there yet expresses fear, which creates things like ego, beliefs, you know, all these things are really derivatives of fear. So couldn't there be a new component in the brain? If the brain has a component for empathy and it does, it has an area that activates your empathy, could that actually be a new component that we could actually put into our system of a, of a I haven't said what the component is, is a um, uh, unconditional love a component? Well, sure, but you'd have to grow that. Just like yeah. we, just like we yeah. grew the, the, the capacity for empathy, then we can grow the capacity for love. We can increase that, but so that's that something. Could be a new component if that came. But, if there suddenly was a new brain. Uh, things started evolving. A new brain component, but, and in a hundred years, it was uh, visible. Finally. But yeah, but we have to develop that out of our yeah. own spiritual growth. Sure. Absolutely, and that's what we're doing here. We're growing out of our own physical. You know, we're becoming more, and as we become more, then the body that we inhabit here obviously reflects more, and you know that will that will change. And there is, you know, there is progress being made. You can, you know, if you, things get better and things get worse. But, you know, you think about, well, it's never, you know, it's always getting worse, right? When you're, when you're young and you look at all this mess that you're, you know, that you're getting into, right? Oh, yeah, geez, man. I'm going to have to grow up being an adult in this, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, uh, it's encouraging. Yeah. It is but it's, encouraging. it gets better, it gets worse. But in general, my sense is it's always getting a little better. So you have this curve, and the curve goes up and down and up and down, but it's kind of on an upward, you know, the trend is up. So I think generally, I'm optimistic, the trend is up. But that doesn't mean it doesn't go up and down some. But if you look at back at you know, what was called the Dark Ages, things were pretty rough back then. You know, there wasn't a whole lot, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of space for anything other than survival for large parts of the, for large parts of the planet. And we're not like that now. You know, there were, you know, we have more growing room, more freedom, more whatever than people have probably ever had. Now that doesn't mean there weren't little pockets of people that had even more than what we have from time to time, but if you look at the planet as a whole, you can see a lot of progress over time. And I think that's, that's a trend, so it's, it's getting better. I think the world you'll have to grow up in and, and become a fascist in, you know, when you take over, <laughs> <laughs> that it'll be better and kinder than, the, you know, than the one you started with. This is a system, right? We almost try to think of this as we're all just beings and we all evolve together over a thousand lifetimes. It's really an open system where some beings evolve out and constantly new beings are yes, evolving in an and open those are system. higher entropy beings and so that keeps it more in flux than if it was a closed system. Yes. It's not a closed system. Yeah. If it was closed, it would not probably evolve much quicker. Than that, right? Yeah, well, the whole thing would, yeah, it'd be like you stick with your class. You know, it's your class that started kindergarten together, you know, and now they're all moving up. By the time they're in graduate school together, 
they're a different class than they were in kindergarten. Now they're sharing their toys and they're, they're being, you know, a, a lot kinder and, and nicer as they grow up. But it's not like that. It's like the school. And as one class graduates out, you know, you got another bunch of kindergartners coming in at the bottom. And this is a schoolhouse. And it's meant to help people interact and raise the quality of their consciousness. The curve keeps moving. I mean, as the evolution goes, I mean, like, let's say 100 years from now, you know, the, the people that will be in our position, let's just, as an example, will be kind of like the, the, norm the people who used to be really egoic and so forth, whereas, you know, this will be more of the norm. And uh, just as an analogy, it will be like the higher level beings or whatever, you know, like the... the there's a number line the bell curve keeps moving up. Yeah. So like, it's moving you know, the people who are semi-retarded, let's say, will be, will be like us in 100 years. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe we're we'll more like, like the people like who are semi-retarded. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to do it. That's probably a bad example. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Right. There is, there is progress. And if you look at the big, if you look at a bigger picture, which is all consciousness, let's look up at the larger consciousness system. Okay, now you probably do have something that you, could that you can approximate with a closed system. Again, you might say not, no, a large consciousness system is just one cell, you know, and a big consciousness bigger than that. But if we just, as far as our vision goes, look at the larger consciousness system, and well, we can say that is sort of a closed system. But the way it evolves is it's got all this fresh consciousness that grows up. And there is some track of the bell curve moving that, that direction. So the whole system is evolving. And as a whole, and getting someplace, but that doesn't mean that we're real close to the top and there's hardly anywhere to go anymore. That means there's lots and lots of things to do. And let's say you get to a point, you know, if we're just going to make up conjecture, let's say you get to a point that the, the bell curve's moved up and kind of hitting against the stop, but you can look at, the, at, your, at your least profitable bits, you know, and you can start to recycle those. You can still... You can still try, you know, what happens is your system maybe gets asymptotic, but most asymptotic systems never end. They go, they approach infinity forever, but never get there. So I don't think it's like we're gonna, we're gonna run up against a stop and become stagnant. I think evolution always has options. And for us to kind of think of the constraints on the larger consciousness system's evolution is kind of silly. You know, we have no idea. That's way out of our, our space of, of understanding. This it goes back to more of the hierarchy you're talking about earlier, about IEOC and free will, or whatever machine mm -hmm. in the brain. So as you become from PMR, Tom, free will, or whatever machine, more aware and in PMR, mm -hmm. do you still respect the boundaries of Tom's awareness unit of consciousness? Yes. There's a you, what happens is that you're not really separate things. Right. So don't think of it as a free will awareness unit as a separate thing, and or as a separate thing. And, and uh, that's a metaphor. Mm -hmm. That's a way for us to think of these things that we can talk about them. Mm -hmm. It's really one thing, okay? And the way we, we talk about it is, well, we're here, and we talk about, well, that's the free will awareness unit. That's that little part that decided to abide by the rule set and get in here and that's evolve right. and is, is limited in its experience of what happens in this physical reality and so on. But you're really just one thing. Right. You're really all one thing. So while you're here, your consciousness can escape, right? You can, you can go out of body, you can have dreams, you can do anything, your consciousness escapes, and so now your consciousness kind of wind around in a, bigger, in a bigger space. But you are still constrained by the rule set. Okay, you can, you can do those things, but your awareness can get bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. but your, your experience can actually grow bigger, because now you can add the experience in the non-physical to the experience in the physical that makes up your set. So suddenly, your your kind of your free will awareness unit, if you will, is is uh, has the physical experience, the dreaming experience, the out of body experience, the lucid dream experience. You know, it starts to, and all those experiences will help you grow. So it's getting bigger, and the bigger your decision space gets, the more it starts to look like one whole thing. Mm -hmm. Even though there's a subset. That's still limited. Right. To, you're still not going to jump 20 feet in the air. At least, again, not if the cameras are looking at you. You know, you're going to you're going to be restricted. So, in a way, we can we can we break these things up into pieces because it's easier for us to talk about the various functions. Mm -hmm. The way we can talk about the function that's here and the function that's there and all this sort of stuff. But that's really a, a figment. That's a it, it's a convenient metaphor that makes it easier for us to discuss the problem. If we had to discuss the problem all in terms of 
you know, one big thing or whatever, it would get so abstract and so whatever that we, we really have a hard time relating to what it was we were saying. It's much better to make these metaphors, even though they're not exactly accurate. It's like, you know, back when I was a kid, atoms were, atoms were uh, little hard balls in the middle with, with <laughs> electrons whizzing around them in orbits, right? And that's wrong. But that's a whole lot easier to tell a sixth grader that that's the way an atom works than it is to say, well, it's a probability cloud of charge. And they go, well, what is that? <laughs> you know, they don't relate to it. Sure. They can't get a grip of that. It's not part of their right. They can hear the words, but it doesn't mean anything to them. Tell them it's a little ball with electrons going around. All right, they got that. Right. So you, you break things down into pieces that you can, that you can operate on, that you can understand. Mm -hmm. But there is really this bigger picture. And the more decision space you get and the more awareness you get, the more you become a citizen of the bigger picture and not just a citizen of PMR. And then suddenly you're living in both places at the same time and you're going and your, your decision space just gets bigger. So that's the, yeah, it's not really, this is this free will awareness unit and this is this other thing and how do, you know, do they send messages back and forth or what? It's really all one thing. Your awareness now is you know, limited to this and then you start doing dreaming and other thing, and now your awareness is a little bigger, and then you realize that those dreams are really educational. You should be learning from them. You know, they're not just experiences, but they're part of your choices. You make choices in those dreams. And then suddenly, once you realize that, you start getting all these little dreams that are just set up for you to make choices. <laughs> suddenly, you realize that. You know, there you are, suddenly, standing at the podium in front of 5,000 people, and you're naked. You know, what do you do? You know, and there's a choice. You know, do you, do you freak out? Do you get embarrassed? Do you run away? Do you hide? Or do you just use your mind to materialize clothes instantly and solve the problem? You know, do you, you know, how do you deal with the situation? And you start getting these dreams that are obviously lessons. Because as soon as you get it right, it disappears. You know, it goes on to the next one. Yeah. And, uh, and you understand that you're, you know, the, the work is never done. You work while you sleep. You know, you work when you're awake. Your whole existence is growing up. Whether you're asleep, awake, meditating, whatever it is, you're in this growing mode. There's no, there's no escape or no holidays. Don't you think it would be easier for kids, I'm sorry, just it's appropriate to this, for kids not to be taught that physical thing <clears throat> at a young age? Because that's how the belief in the physical thing is in planted. Yeah, that's our culture. It's though. inherent flaw. Yeah, that's, that's our culture and the way our culture works. But yes, there was a book out probably 25, 30 years ago called The Crack in the Cosmic Egg, and it was by... Um, Joseph Chilton. Yeah, Joseph Chilton. Yeah, Chilton, Chilton Pierce. Chilton Pierce. Yeah. My book's and, uh, the Cosmic Egg. He, uh, he basically had, a, had an idea, and it was a, maybe another book after that. He said you should never teach children to read or to do things that are basically intellectual things until after the age of seven. He says, if you teach them to read when they're four or five or six or seven, he says it messes up their development and it, it uh, causes them to lose their connection with the bigger reality because it forces them into an intellectual mode before they really have done all their processing in the bigger mode. And uh, whether that's, you know, whether that's, whether that's true or not, I don't necessarily know whether Pierce, you know, had to, had the right thing there. There is something about each seven. They say the thought is they don't talk about each seven. But anyway, that's a, that's a thought, you know, that, that uh, little children kind of have a foot in both worlds. You know, they're very imaginative. They, you know, they, they have imaginary friends. Well, they're not imaginary friends. You know, they have friends that are non-physical. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they have they're very imaginative with what's going on around them. We call it imaginative because that's the way we see it. But basically, they've got a foot in both realities. They're integrated into the whole, into the whole thing much better than we are. And somewhere around seven years old, you know, six or seven, that ends. And then suddenly, they're, they're committed. You know, PMR residents and all the rest <laughs> of that stuff is gone. And partly, we, yeah. we coach them out of that. We tell them, that's nonsense. You know, it's just a dream. You know, don't pay any attention to it, and they have, you know, they tell their friends, oh, you know, meet my imaginary friend, friend tell them that they're silly, you know, and eventually they, they let it go. But it also, it's, that's part of the process. You're supposed to be a part of physical reality. You know, you're supposed to not necessarily be here and there until you earn that, until you understand it. 
they are because they come in that way. Eventually they grow out of it. Now whether or not teaching them to read till after the seven will affect that or not, I don't know. But uh, yes, we do, we, our culture has cultural beliefs. And you can go to different cultures, like go to a culture where, where the, the shaman are prominent and you can turn into animal forms and there's spirits in the trees and in the rocks and all that sort of thing. Completely different worldview. Their worldview is not one that is, um, yeah, that is, you know, what do we call it, deterministic in the sense that, you know, I lost the word, but anyway, they have a much broader, more fluid kind of culture. And in those places, those people will tell you that uh, it's a very important part of their life. You know, the spirit beings are very integrated into their daily life and what they do. And we look at them and say, oh, you know, they're all crazy. You know, they're all silly. You know, they're all just believe this garbage. <coughs> It's not garbage, and they're not silly. It actually, you know, those spirits and the things that they deal with are all part of their life. It's all integrated into their existence. Well, it's not our culture. Our culture is, is one that, uh, you know, Western culture is our culture, and it's very much, uh, you know, scientific method, and uh, things are objective. This is an objective reality, and our kids grew up in that, too. And we, we talk about beliefs, you know, just as we discussed here when we first started this, Everything we do, and we try to explain something, we turn it into a to an objective explanation, right? Well, you get a crop circle, and there must be aliens doing it because something has to do it. Because in objective reality, it doesn't happen unless somebody does it. You know, so we we start immediately arranging things to suit our beliefs. That's the way it is all over. Is that because we're just you know the mass of the consciousness is just. Uh, they're trying to latch on to the objectivity because they're just not uh, involved enough to accept the fact that it's... it's That's part of it, and part of it, part of it we think the way we think because we are part of a culture. There is a, you know, Jung talked about these archetypes over cultures. You know, and cultures are, are uniform to an extent that you wouldn't really expect. That was his eye. That's where he came to it from. There's so much uniformity in the way you think and the concepts in a culture and how did they get that? You know, nobody taught them that. You know, where does that come from? And he basically theorized then kind of like a group mind. You know, they were getting it through the vibes, if you will, with each other. And uh, then you get like the hundredth monkey thing where, you know, one monkey comes in already smart to a culture because others, the associates are smart to that culture. And there's some truth to that. The reason that a mob deteriorates to the lowest common denominator is because of a kind of a group mind effect. And we are social beings. I like to say, <laughs> herd animals. You know, <laughs> we're herd animals. That's our nature. And we tend to have this, this, this group interactions going on. And you get in with a bunch of people who are angry, and you'll find that eventually you'll start to get angry. You get in with a bunch of people who are, you know, loving and caring, and everything will lighten up, you know, and you'll smile more, and everything will be good. It's not just you. It's the... It's the environment you're in, the culture. So some of our cultural stuff just comes to us as, you know, because we live in that culture. It's not that we're necessarily taught. And we don't take our children down and, and say, reality is objective. Remember that. You know? They just get it. They just get it. Because that's the way we all think. It's what we all believe. And they do get the lesson in a lot of tiny little details. But nobody has to tell them that that's a belief or, or pound it into them. You know, like, don't lock yourself in a wardrobe, right? Don't lock yourself in a refrigerator, you know? You keep telling children things like that, and eventually it makes an impression. But this, they just get. So our culture spreads through the vibes, if you will, because we're social creatures and we're all connected, and we tend to, we, we tend to conform. We tend to do what the herd does, and uh, that's an influence. The fact everybody that's here is all obviously bucking the herd in some way you know we're all swimming upstream against the current but that's what it requires to grow otherwise you just kind of wander around the field and moo and you know nothing changes <laughs> if you want to evolve you do have to buck the current but that makes us exceptional and and uh, we still are influenced by that by that uh, herd and you know it, it's a strong stream you go against the current yeah it's a strong stream and we get very much influenced by by that herd John, are we going to remember this when we come back? <laughs> How much of this will be in our 
Well, what you, when you come back in the next incarnation here, everything that you have learned, everything that you got at the being level, you come back with. So if you, you know, if you develop that capacity to love or compassion or whatever you did, then you, you die, you come back, you will still have that, but you will have it as a potential. It's like you've already filled out that mold to that far. Now you come back, you're going to have to do it again, but it's a lot easier because you've already been there and done that. So it's just going to kind of naturally connect for you. Is the bigger picture, I mean, that's really what I was getting at. The knowledge that we are gaining through you, is that going to stick? <laughs> Only as it changes you to the being level. If it's just intellectual, it's gone when you're gone. Is that the thing you love, the non-physical is the conservation of quality of consciousness? Yeah, conservation, yeah, your quality of consciousness, that's, that's at your being level. What you understand, that goes with you. Everything at the intellectual level, it's gone. No, I understand that. Yeah. So in as much as you take what I say and, and convert that into a change in yourself, then yes, you, you get to keep that forever. You know, you don't lose that potential. But in as much as it's just a, a theory, and you understand all the theory, it's an intellectual thing, won't make any difference. Well, when you're in the NPMR, you can go back to the database and, and see that again. You can go back to the database, but if you haven't really learned it at the being level, you, have to, you haven't really learned it. You still oh, okay. have to learn it again. Whereas if you've learned it at the being level, it's like it's already there. You don't have to learn it again. All you have to do, it's like a, you know, it's like a pair of pants that are too big when you're little. You know, you just, you're going to grow into it. It's already there. You already got those pants. And it's like that. But if you, uh, if it's just intellectual, yeah, you can go back. You can get the data again. And you know, like any lesson, if you've learned, you know, if, you, if you've relearned it ten times, it gets easier. Eventually, you intellect, you get below the intellect into the being level. So that's why it's an iterative process. Each time you. Sometimes you have to learn the same lesson over and over and over again before you take it on and, and actually learn it at the being level. So that's what's important. So I keep saying that, and I say it in the book, and I say it in, the, in my things. Just getting an intellectual level is not the point. We can all sound like you know accomplished wizards and, and you know high priests of love talking to each other, but that's not where it is. You really have to get it at the being level. Not that you act that way, but that you are that way. Not that you can intellectually discuss it, but that, you know, you can be it. And that's what's important. That's, that's really the important part. <clears throat> Since we're a part of a large consciousness system, how do we get spawned out as individual units of consciousness? Does the larger system at some point say, here's a blank, a blank subset of me, go forth and learn? I mean, what's the... Kind of well, we are all part. You know, that's a good question too. We're all part of of this larger thing, right? And the way we tend to think of it, because we have habits of physical reality thinking, is that we're all these little individuals, these little chunks. Because in physical reality, everything's individual, right? No two things can occupy the same space. You know, everything is separate. Well, so we take that concept and we we move that up to the next level. We say everything's separate. Okay, then there's if I had you know. A thousand different lives, and there's a thousand little different <coughs> lives out there, and they're all separate. Even if there is one being that kind of pulls it all together, we still see it as pieces. But it's really not like that. So where, how do we, how do we come out of the system? In my way of thinking, and this is just another metaphor. All of these things are, are metaphors. It, the metaphors are our language. It's the way we break things into symbols and concepts that we can then discuss. In my way, I see this larger consciousness system, and it just bubbles up, boils up. You know, I almost think like a flare coming out of the sun, you know, it just, and that's an individual. And that individual then interacts here and it disappears. You know, and then another, so it just kind of bubbles up these individual IUOCs, individuated units of consciousness, as necessary, as needed. It's evolving. We're part of the strategy, part of the mechanism of that evolution. But what, what is consistent is the, is the history. It's the data gain. So that, that little, that little uh, piece of the larger conscious system has a unique set of experiences. You know, never does any consciousness, I'm sure, have exactly the same duplicate experience because we're all bumping around the thing. There's all this randomness. So you have a unique experience. Now, 
if there's room for another for another one in the game because the rule set and the probability supports it, and you look around and say, well, somebody with a with a resume like this, you know, would fit real well. Well, if you have that resume, then you know your history then kind of gets activated in the sense that you get to then add to that history. But then you're, we're really part of the larger thing. So I don't really think of us as a whole bunch of separate lumps that stay separate, and then we all grow up, and then one day we all melt in the arm. You know, it's, that's very mechanical and very physical kind of based. I see it as we're all part of one thing. And as it becomes useful to that one thing, you know, we, uh, we're back in this system. And we evolve, but we're part of a history thread. We have a unique, we are unique in our experience, not unique in our, in our, you know, in physical chunks, not unique in our, our bodies or in our, uh, you know, like we're a three dimension, you know, see, there's no dimensions there. So you know, what is this unique stuff? We're all these little things that you're going to set up there that are all your past lives. It's this data. So we're a unique data set, if you will. And part of that unique data set comes into this learning lab when there's some decent probability that it might learn something. Uh, and then it's when it's gone, it's gone. And then if some of that unique data set come back here again, then that data set will grow a little bit. Now you got a productive data set that seems to grow a lot every time it's back here. Then that's a character you'd play a lot, right? If you were if you were playing a game and you got one character that really gets a lot of points, you know, play that character more. You get a character that just doesn't seem to be able to get anywhere. You kind of leave that character alone. You don't play it or you cash it in, right? You Hit the, hit the delete button. So it's, it's that kind of a thing. You play the characters that are profitable? You know, I would think so. I mean, why, why uh, play unprofitable characters if there's, if there's no need? But even if you don't play an unprofitable character, that unprofitable character's history still is there. You know, there's no reason to erase anybody's history. You know, it's still there as a, as a possibility, a potentiality. And uh, I guess the idea is to probably uh, you get all the characters to move up the chain. You know, I don't think there's any character in the game that's like a useless character. You know, I just I said delete, but that's more of a video game. You know, basically it's the whole idea is that we evolve, and in the beginning we tend to evolve faster because we're, you know, it's just like children. You know, a three-year-old really learns fast. They probably triple every you know what they know. You know, their vocabulary. You know, go well now. How much? How many of us have doubled our vocabulary? You know. We don't do that anymore, you know, now we're adding a little bit, we're up in this asymptotic curve where we don't do that. Well, it's the same with growing up. You tend to, you tend to, uh, can, can grow more quickly for a while and then you kind of level off and then, oh, aha, you start growing more quickly again, you know, and then you tend to level off and it goes up in plateaus like that. So the, I think with consciousness, you actually grow and evolve faster as time goes on. But again, everything gets asymptotic eventually but it never gets to stop. What determines when a consciousness comes in to participate in the VR? I mean, some consciousness come in as an elephant or a dog or a person. What determines that? What determines that is where it would be most likely for them to learn something valuable. I think if you're, it's what you're ready for. If what you're ready for is the decision space of a dog, because you can deal with that, because you've maybe dealt with something a little less than that or maybe that before, you get comfortable enough to where you can have a, a greater decision space, you may then come in as a monkey or whatever else, you know, and then you get to a point where, you know, your decision space, you can handle the decision space that's bigger. In other words, it's profitable for you to have a bigger decision space, then you come in as a human. So I think that basically whatever your consciousness is, if you're a computer consciousness, then you're probably not going to come in as a human because you act and think like a computer. You would come in something that was more suitable to you. So you get suitable. So we've all been lower. Well, lower. maybe, maybe. It depends on where we all came from and, you know, what we, you know, it doesn't, it's not necessarily that everybody started out as amoeba and ended up here. But yes, generally consciousness is evolving. All those consciousness elephants and dogs and monkeys, they're growing too. Just like the sheep that evolved right. morality, they made, you know. Their decisions. They made their decisions and then they live by the consequences. But it's a much slower game. It's a real <coughs> slow game because an awful lot of what they do is hardwired. You know, it's just it's just the way they are. 
to hardwire it in. That means their decision space is small. The stuff that hardwire is not part of their decision space. So they have a small decision space. A bumblebee has a small decision space. A lot of it's just hardwired. It does it because it does it because that's the way it's genetic. You know, it's evolved to do it that way. So as it can handle a bigger decision space and is likely, the probability is significant that it can grow by that challenge and it moves up to that challenge, which is part of the reason you say we have this open system stuff keeps moving right, in right. from the bottom up and it keeps going out. So yeah, it's part of a big evolutionary chain, but that doesn't mean that all of us used to be, you know, birds and then we were cats and then we were dogs and then we were monkeys. Right. It's not like that. It's just that you end up wherever it looks like is the best potential for you to learn. If you're only used to handling a dog's decision space, you know, you don't necessarily want to get overwhelmed with a suddenly a huge decision space. It would be kind of overwhelming. You wouldn't know what to do with it. It would be frightening and overwhelming. So you work your way up in small But you see the YouTube pieces. video of the dog who goes on the freeway and drags the dog that was hit by a car off the freeway. That's like yeah. exceptional. That's like a huge decision. Right. Did you see the dog that. in Japan, the two dogs in Japan just recently? Sure. No. I mean, that happens infrequently, but it does happen. And so that would be something that would probably... Yeah, dogs ready to break. <laughs> yeah. yeah, two dogs in Japan, just uh, one of them wouldn't leave his, uh, after the tsunami, uh, wouldn't leave his buddy dog and just stay with sure. them. Sure. So attitude. dogs get to make decisions. Right. You know, what they do and what they don't do, just like people. And as they grow from those decisions, then they get to try. Bigger opportunities. They get tr bigger opportunities, right. What if there's a, and this is an idea I have, uh, that uh, possibly uh, a, a bit of consciousness that wants to experience a good group of consciousnesses uh, would come in as a dog because that was the only way to get in. <laughs> I don't know that it's restricted to the only way to get in, but sometimes a being that was a human might come in to be a dog or a cat just to hang out with somebody, just to experience it. You know, it doesn't take much. You talk about, you have this individual unit of consciousness. Well, how much do you have to commit to a, you know, to a bumblebee's life or right. to whatever? If you think there's something there to learn, now if it's just doing it for fun, then there wouldn't be much interest, right? All, everything has to have a potential for growth. So there'd have to be a reason there. But maybe the reason would be to be with somebody else or to be, you know, whatever. It's hard to say, but it's not impossible. Almost nothing is impossible. When you live in a statistical, probabilistic reality, it's hard to say that anything's impossible. You can only say things are unlikely. But, and particularly when it's that big, with that many things going on, almost everything that can happen does happen. Well, there's been some discussion on the board of vegetarianism and eating other animals, and, and some people have said, yes, but I didn't, if I didn't have that chicken to eat, then the chicken wouldn't have a life. So I'm actually providing them with uh, the ability to have an experience here, even though I eat it later. Wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah, you know, I heard, it was real funny, but uh, when I was first, uh, Pamela and I were first getting into dogs, uh, we were looking at different kinds of breeds of dogs, and we were thinking of an old English sheepdog. So we're reading about only the sheepdogs, and, and the book on dogs and on only the sheepdogs says that they cut off their tails so that they wouldn't hurt themselves. Because they're wagging that tail, banging it into things, you know, and that, that's why they cut off the, you know, and of course that doesn't make any sense, you know. So that was kind of a standing joke for us. Of course, they cut off their tails for a historical reason. It was to tell whether or not they paid the tax or not. But um, it was to protect the dog from injuring its tail. So you cut its tail off. And then you're doing it a great service because then it can never injure its tail. That sounds like <laughs> that rationalization, yes. Uh, no, you know, the vegetarian thing is basically about, you know, it's a moral decision. Now, to some people, it's a, it's a nutritional decision or it's, it's something else. It, it has to do with, uh, um, you know, w with what they eat and whatever. But for me, it's just, it's, a, it's more of a moral decision. If you... You know, other things are there learning and growing, and that includes chickens as well. And you raise them to kill them. What are you doing to their opportunity to evolve? Well, you may say that, well, hey, a barnyard, you know, or a cattle pen is a good place to evolve. But is it really? It seems to me there's just a bunch of, you've limited the decision space so much by penning them all up, you know, in a box that they no longer have the kind of decisions they had when they were wild, you know, when the cattle or the horses or whatever it was were, the chickens were out, you know, 
doing whatever they did in the wild, they had a lot of they had a much bigger decision space. When you hatch them and keep them in a little box, then uh, but, you've kind of taken the decision space away. Not entirely. You've just shrunk it. But down. You, the unfertilized eggs. Is, there's no problem with eating an unfertilized yeah. egg, is there? It doesn't have any potential for life. No, I wouldn't think there would be any problem. Okay. Would be any problem. But it, so the point is, what are you doing? And you have to balance. Well, there's still some decision space, even if you just live in a box. You live in a box by yourself, there's very little decision space. So now you've, you've kind of created a, a branch of these critters that uh, no longer have much decision space and they're not learning very much, but it's not reduced to zero. So, yeah, it's, again, I think it's, their it's, thought is, but at least they're alive. At least they had the chance to come in and experience the VR. And, and it seems to me like they would have a chance, another, a different chance. Mm-hmm. If that chance wasn't available, that it's yes, I would think they would have. They are just consciousness, right. and they're mm-hmm. evolving at a level that is that is effective for them. Now, if in the if that if this reality, let's say, supports um, you know a hundred thousand living critters, of course it's billions, but that's it. Well, and that's because we're raising a whole bunch of them for meat, and if you took away the the meat then it only supports 10,000 critters, which are wild critters. Well, it's really not that way. You see, it's the opposite of that way. There's a lot more wild critters than there are critters in pens. So the opportunity to come back as a critter would probably not be a problem. So I would think that would not not be a good excuse. Is there repercussions for treating sentient beings in the cows, the pigs? The, the repercussions? Well, the repercussions are mainly there if your awareness supports it. You know, what Again, it's not the act so much that's the problem as it is your level of awareness. So if you have no level of awareness and you just eat meat because your family always ate meat or whatever, you're probably not losing points because you're eating meat. It's just what you do. You know, it's where you are. It's like we're saying, it's just it's the kind of person you are doing what you do. But if you're aware that, you know, you're, you know, well, we're aware of some things. Like we don't eat our neighbors, right? We don't go over and steal the neighbor's children and have them for dinner, you know. That's... We, we're aware of that, right? That's not a good idea. And then as that awareness kind of gets bigger, you might say, well, you know, all those chickens, you know, piled one in a box in a barn with 5,000 of them all, they can't even move because if they move, it, you know, and is that cruel? And what are we doing? And is that a good idea? And you certainly get a moral awareness of that not maybe being such a good idea and it's not nice for them and it's, it's not, and then, now, if you go start, you know, eating lots of chickens, or you or you decide to build one of those things yourself because it's profitable, suddenly you're going to pay a penalty for that because you know better. Once you know better, you need to act. You know, as you grow up, you need to act more moral as you become more moral. So, it's a, you know, no, I don't think people that eat meat or or you know are are uh, losing points in the in the evolution game unless they're aware of whatever it is they're doing is not being moral, and then if they do it anyway, they're losing points in the evolution game. So part of it has to do with your, with your level of awareness and what you, under, what you understand. So you kind of need to do different things as you grow up. And there's never any way of going back. You can't unlearn something. It's like you say, oh, I realize that's immoral, but see, it tastes good. You know? <laughs> now suddenly you're being immoral, and you know it, and it's a problem. So it's part of, it's you and your intent. And, and uh, you can't go back and say, I'm going to unlearn that. You know, I, don't, I don't want to know that that's immoral because it's inconvenient. You can't do that, now you're stuck. Now if you decide to do what's immoral and you know it's immoral, now you're paying a penalty in the evolution game. So it, it depends on the, on the individual. John? I think a good analogy for that would be to say a deer hunter that eats deer meat because he enjoys killing deer. That would be a negative thing, as opposed to somebody that needs that food for their family and that's what's available. And they, you know, they're deeply appreciative of that deer's life, you know, in order for their family to survive. There's a big, big difference there. Absolutely. There are, there are those that go deer hunting and just leave the carcass laying on the ground because it's so much yeah. fun to kill a deer. Well, it's, and it's there are, the killing part. yeah, those are those that hunt because they actually put the meat in the freezer and that's, that's why they're, you know, that's how their families eat. There's a big difference between that. Yeah, you can't say that all the lions, tigers, and bears are immoral because they eat meat. You know, that's, that's where they are, that's what they do, that's how they survive. The but it. if the lion, tiger, or bear goes out and just kills things for fun, and leaves the bodies around, then we say that's not good. 
you know, it's that's a moral decision yeah, and it's a moral decision, and, and the whole thing doesn't matter so much whether you shoot the deer as it is why. It's the intent you have when you shoot, whether or not you know it's something that you're going to pay the price for, or whether it's something that that you don't. So the horrible conditions that the chickens, for instance, go through to be produced and put on the table is the worst part. If you raise, I mean, because that's really horrible. But if you raise the chickens free range, you talk to them. You know, someday you're going to be dinner. I mean, I'm a vegetarian, so I mean, I, I haven't eaten meat in a couple of years, but if I was in a situation where the only food available is, you know, I'd have to kill a deer, and then as long as you're going to, if you're doing it for survival, it's completely different than if you have factory yeah. farms and you're supporting an industry yeah. that's torturing it and, and you know, sl yeah. enslaving other sentient beings. It's totally different. Right. Situation. Everyone has to come to that moral decision on their own and for their own self. It depends on the level of awareness that you have and whatever. So it's an individual sort of decision. You can't say that, you know, it's a problem for everybody. It's not. It's an individual, like like everything else we do. It's, it's, it's us. You know, it's individual. What's, what's our intent and if you figure that you're adding to you know to torturing chickens and little tiny coops then you ought to stop if you don't have that idea then you go on maybe until you get that idea so it's it's not a thing that everybody should do this or everybody should do that we're all in different stages of, of growth and hopefully as we all grow to care more about things and say well that's a sentient being it's evolving like we are I don't want to you know, override its free will with my free will. So I kill things because I, I enjoy it is not a necessarily a good reason. I kill things because I have to live, because I have to survive. That's a different reason altogether. It's whether, it's sort of, why are you killing? Why are you contributing to the slaughter of that animal? Is it justified in your moral sense? Necessary. Yeah, is it necessary? Is it, is, do you have to do that? And if it's like, well, yeah, I could be a vegetarian and I could still be healthy and I could still get along just fine, but I like the taste of flesh, and therefore I'll, you know, I'll kill it just to, to feed my, my like for it. Well, now you're kind of on shaky ice, aren't you, as far as morality goes? So it depends well, on so the... Dis 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 sorry, from, from our food production, we, we're, we don't feel we're killing it. Well, it's purposely done. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, if you contribute to it, it's, it's all part of the same. That's, that's yeah. probably how people, they, they're not yeah. connected with the fact that they are killing. When they buy a package of beef in the store, they're not thinking this came from, you know, someone, this cow had to be, you know, hung up and the whole deal. No, they don't. They're not aware. It's all yeah. sanitized. They detach us from They're detached, yeah. Mm -hmm. But they don't want to know either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.